Well, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Wyant, the founder and president of AgriPulse Communications, and I'm really pleased to have so many of you join us for this webinar. Our topic today is ASA Wishes Seven Global Trends for 2025 how WISH is building the next generation of customers for U.S. soy protein. Thanks to the United Soybean Board, the American Soybean Association, and the World Initiative for Soy and Human Health for sponsoring this opportunity. Today, we're going to be joined by three distinguished speakers with facilitated questions and answers. I'm going to make some brief speaker introductions here at the start and encourage you to dig into their full biographies on our website. We also want to hear from you, so make sure that when you have a question, offer those at the Q&A portion at the bottom of your screen, not the chat box. If you are experiencing any technical difficulties during this, please use the Q&A function to let us know, and our team will assist you. In addition, we're also going to be recording this webinar, and it will be available tomorrow on agra-pulse.com. So first off, I'd like to introduce our speakers, starting with Gina Perry, who serves as WISH's Executive Director, leading the strategic trajectory of WISH's market development and long-term trade opportunities for U.S. soy in developing and emerging markets. She joined the American Soybean Association WISH program in March of 2019 after managing the USDA's Amplifies Poultry Food for Progress project in Ghana and then serving in a strategic capacity with the organization. She came to WISH after nearly four years with AgriCorps, a nonprofit focused on agricultural education in Ghana and Liberia. So welcome, Gina. She's joined today by Maury Hill and Tony Melanthin. Hill is the chairman of the American Soybean Association's World Initiative for Soy in Human Health. Hill is a farmer from Madrid, Iowa. He's been on the American Soybean Association Board of Directors since 2017. He's a third generation farmer on his family's 400 acres with a crop rotation of corn and soybeans. He and his wife Rhonda have a small sheep herd of 15 to 20 head and 40 to 50 flock of laying hens. He graduated from my alma mater, Go Cyclones, Iowa State University in 1985 with a Bachelor of Liberal Studies and began farming part time when he returned from the Army in 1975 at full-time farming in 2005. He's been a member of the Iowa Soybean Association since 2014 and is a graduate of ASA's DuPont Young Leaders Class of 2015 and the 2017 Leadership at its Best Class. Tony Melanthin is a Wisconsin soybean farmer who also serves as a director on the United Soybean Board. He represents USB as an ex-officio member of the American Soybean Association's World Initiative for Soy Human Health Program Committee. His participation in WISH has included the WISH Global Food Security Dialogues at the U.S. Naval Academy in 2023, and he plans to join WISH for its 2025 Food Security Dialogue in Guatemala. For Tony and his wife, Katie, soybean farming is more than just a livelihood, it's a legacy. His family has grown soybeans for three generations in Western Wisconsin, and they're parents of three young children. So to kick us off today, we're going to have Gina tell us a little bit more about WISH and start out with our first slide. So Gina, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And it's so good to see so many of you online for this exciting webinar um, talking about global trends that we see, especially in developing and emerging markets. Just to give a quick background on WISH before we jump into the trends, um, so the World Initiative for Soy and Human Health, we call WISH for short, is a program of the American Soybean Association. We work to develop agricultural value chains to create long-term demand for U.S. soy. And we do that through the improvement of health, nutrition, and food security. So really working at that intersection of trade development and food security, which makes us unique um, from other organizations working in the international space. Um, we were funded, founded uh, nearly 25 years ago by visionary soybean farmers who saw the need to diversify markets and start looking at new markets and how to build new markets to create new customers in the future. We really take a long-term approach 
in developing these markets. There's a lot of challenges, but also a lot of opportunities that exist in developing emerging markets. And so as we go through today, you'll hear some of the exciting trends that are helping drive that demand for soy and ultimately creating uh, new markets for U.S. soy as well. Um, we would like to thank the United Soybean Board for their investment in WISH, uh, as well as for helping fund this great webinar today. Our staff at WISH has over 300 years combined experience of working and developing emerging markets to create demand for U.S. soy. And many of us have, have lived and worked in the countries that we work in. So if we go to the next, the next slide, you will see a map of all the markets that we work in. We're in 29 markets across Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and Central America and the Dominican Republic. Within these markets, we're working in different sectors, mainly the poultry, aquaculture, and human food spaces. The sectors that we work in within specific countries are also often determined by maturity of those market sectors, but also um, the uh, opportunity that exists there. Um, so as we're moving into the first trend, um, we combined actually um, on the next slide, uh, the top two trends that we see because they really partner well together. The first one being that developing economies are growing economies. You saw that we're in about 16 countries across Sub-Saharan Africa. That continent is at the top of the list for the world's top 20, or top 20 fastest growing economies. And that includes Tanzania, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Nigeria, all markets that WISH has worked in and some we have worked in for nearly two decades. The continent of Africa was really affected by the war in Ukraine and continues to be affected. But even with those challenges, we see that the outlook for growth in, in Africa is set at 14, or excuse me, 4% um, coming into the next year. Alternatively, if we look uh, towards Southeast Asia, Cambodia, where we've been working over the past eight years, we see that Cambodia's projected economic growth is around 6%. So there's a lot of opportunity that exists in these markets as these economies are growing. And that really leads into trend two as well, that growing populations are driving demand for protein. Um, the FAO, a Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, um, sees that animal protein is expected to double by 2050. These populations are growing as incomes are rising. People are wanting more protein. And I've seen that in many of the conversations that I've had um, around the world that they're, they're really hungry for protein, whether it's from fish, eggs, chicken, or adding soy protein into other human foods and beverages. Um, looking again at the continent of Africa, we see where 26 of those countries are expected to double their current size. Um, so that's a lot of people that um, are looking for nutritious foods to eat, but it's also a lot of people that are looking to grow their economies and have employment opportunities. So by working in the poultry and aquaculture spaces, and the human food development side, they're not only creating nutritious and protein dense products, but they're also growing their economies. So I would like to pass over to Maury Hill now. Um, Maury has been with us um, on, on many WISH trips and is able to see what's actually happening on the ground. So Maury, I'd love to hear from you um, some of your real world examples as it relates to these two trends. Okay, thank you, Gina. Um, you know, as, uh, Countries and economies grow, people just want to eat better. And I've seen firsthand how WISH helps develop those markets and teach people not only the value of soy protein in their diets, but also how they can, you know, use that expertise to raise their own living standard of living and help other people eat better. Um, like Gina said, you know, Nigeria is one of the countries that WISH works in and their projected population is, is supposed to pass the U.S. by 2050. And as economies grow and populations grow, people just want to eat better. So WISH's mission to help people understand how protein can be used in their diets and move forward with better nutrition and more sustainability in their own markets is just a natural fit for what WISH does around the world. Uh, like Gina said, I've been to Ghana, I've been to Cambodia and seen some of the work that WISH does. And what I find so rewarding is that as WISH educates the population of the value of soy in their pro protein in their diets, they also demonstrate how it can be used and how it can work to make them, you know, more self-reliant and still eat better and have 
more protein in their diet and have a better health aspect. Um, it's just one of those things as I think as people that we need to do is anything that we can help people eat better and live better. It fits very well into what wish does for their mission. Thanks for that, Maury. Um, let's bring Tony into the fold here and talk about the third trend that you've identified here and, and the role of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having me on. And uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction earlier. I think to my knowledge, it's the first time I've been called distinguished. So we'll see, see if I live up to it. But uh, being the next generation myself on our farm, uh, I can I can speak to this quite well, I believe. And, and to start, just to kind of give a little background, I, I want to say some numbers here, just to kind of give the scope and gravity of what the next generation will be doing. Uh, in Africa alone, the continent of Africa, it's estimated that in the next five to six years, the labor force will increase to 375 million people, so larger than the entire population of the United States. Um, when looking at Nigeria specifically, approximately 60%, a little over 60% of that population is under 25 years old. Um, and, and WISH is not alone in recognizing these trends. One example of that uh, through global organizations is the MasterCard, MasterCard Foundation. They have a program, it's called the Happy Broiler Program in Ghana. Uh, that is targeting youth in Ghana and aiming to create 326,000 jobs in the poultry sector in Ghana. And that perfectly aligns with which is, wishes, uh, strategies and goals inside that country. Um, we are in Ghana, uh, we, we are in the poultry sector. And so I think a common theme you will notice as we talk about WISH, uh, as you look more into WISH, is the partnerships that we have and the alignment that we have, uh, strategic alignment amongst multiple organizations, not just in the soy family, but globally as well. Uh, one, one example, uh, WISH is implementing internship programs across Africa and Asia, uh, Cambodia specifically, uh, they're targeting college graduates, giving them real world expertise, real world, real world experience. And part of that is utilizing soy based feeds uh, when they're when they're feeding, whether it be aquaculture or poultry. So those are a couple key partners or a couple key items when it comes to next generation. Thanks, Tony. Um, that is one thing that I think that sometimes uh, here when we're think uh, citizens of the United States, we think about feeding soy products to uh, livestock, but aquaculture also plays a, a big role. So Gina, will you explain how you've been developing that market? Great, absolutely. So aquaculture as a sector has really taken off rapidly over the last few years. Um, we see that wild caught, uh, stocks are depleting. There's also geopolitical issues when it comes around um, livestock or wild stock catching. Um, we're also seeing where policies in countries, especially across sub-Saharan Africa, are shifting away from fishing in large lakes like Lake Victoria in East Africa and allowing for on-land aquaculture production. They're seeing that there's challenges within the lake. You have you know, five or six countries that are trying to fish out of the same spot, there's disease. Um, and so they're they're allowing for on-land production. Um, and so we see that aquaculture is the world's fastest expanding food production system. In Africa alone, aquaculture is expanding at nearly twice the global average. Um, and it's reaching up to 23% in some regions. And fish and other aquaculture products are naturally um, already culturally appropriate protein sources. They're already being consumed. We just need to figure out how those production pr practices can be more efficient and they're using best management practices. Um, we also see that you know, aquatic foods aquaculture provides more than 3 billion people with at least 20% of their average per capita animal protein intake. And to take that a step further, further in Cambodia specifically, We've been working in the aquaculture sector since 2018 there through a Food for Progress project with USDA. 
Um, they, Cambodians eat a lot of fish and they get 65 to 75% of their daily protein intake just from fish alone. So their annual consumption of fish is about 100, 127 pounds per person per year. So they're eating a lot of fish, but the production practices and country just aren't quite efficient enough to be producing that domestically. Um, so looking at high quality feed, best production practices, quality fingerlings available in country, um, also post harvest and processing, processing, making sure that full value chain is efficient enough to continue to grow and evolve. Um, we also see in Nigeria, they're the second biggest aquaculture producer on the continent. And yet their home, they have a 2.5 uh, million ton deficit of production of fish. So that means they're having to import over 2 million tons of fish just to meet the local demand. So that creates a huge opportunity for aquaculture producers, for processors, for markets, and also ultimately for U.S. soy. Um, and I know, Maury, you talked a little bit about Cambodia, um, and you were also in Ghana and got to see some of our aquaculture work there. Um, so we'd love to hear your input on um, what you've seen and, and kind of how you've seen these aquaculture sectors grow. Thank you, Gina. Uh, next slide, please. Like I said earlier, one of the things that WISH is so good at is educating and demonstrating and not only teaching the, the fish farmers or the aquaculture people how to raise better fish, but also along the whole supply chain, there needs to be a educational component as far as how to produce the feed, deliver the feed, and how that will help everybody's bottom line. Um, as part of the training that WISH supplies to our local people, as in Cambodia, for example, not only teaching them how to use better water resources to raise their, their fish, you know, in, in cages, so to speak, that also they need to learn how to uh, better diets and better, better feed rations per species of fish is available. One of the big things that, that WISH and the, the soy industry has determined that with the extruded soy meal as the main ingredient for fish pellets, it floats and the fish are able to uh, not have to feed off the bottom. They have a better uh, rate of gain. And also they, because of that, then they get to market sooner. They have less waste and le less disease. But like, the, like we found out during COVID, the supply chain and the feed millers and the feed ingredient manufacturers need to catch up with that too. And so as the demand grows for the fish and for the aquaculture products, the supply chain needs to be caught up and you know be able to supply the feed for the ones that are raising the fish. And so that's uh, one of the main things that, that WISH works on, not only as far as teaching people the value of soy in their protein diets, but how to raise better fish and trying to get the whole supply chain up to speed so that they can be self-reliant. And I would just add a couple of uh, additional remarks on the feed space, both in aquaculture and poultry. Um, you know, we're seeing where feed accounts for 60 to 75% of production costs, which is quite substantial. Um, so making sure that producers know the value of high quality feed um, and that they're feeding to the growth stages of either the birds or the fish to better and more efficiently utilize feed, um, but also working with feed mills to make sure that they have um, the latest information on nutrition, on mixing, on keeping their equipment up to date and making sure that it's running efficiently. So we're really having to work on both the, the demand of high quality feed, but also the supply, really working in parallel and in tandem to make sure that the producers know where they can buy high quality feed, but the feed mills also know that there are customers that are willing to pay for it and are kind of and growing the demand for that. Um, and we've seen that in Cambodia, we've seen that in Ghana and elsewhere across West Africa. And um, we're also looking at, you know, the um, size of, of feed bags available, even something as simple as that, because you have smaller producers and maybe a 50 kg bag is not appropriate for their size of the operation. Maybe they can't use all of that for a certain growth stage of, of the bird or the fish, or um, their storage isn't you know appropriate for storing 
uh, this feed for a long period of time. So really looking at it from a bunch of different angles of, of how do we make high quality feed available and um, economically viable for these producers um, as they start off as maybe medium sized producers and look to grow to, to larger scale producers as well. Thanks, Gina. Yeah, this uh, photo, it looks like a fairly modern operation compared to you know, some that we've seen with people that uh, were basically uh, feeding table scraps and things like that compared to nutritious, efficient feed. So Tony, let's bring you back in again and talk about the last two trends. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, trend number six, building stability leads to better markets, which leads to better trade. That's something that I, I really enjoy talking about. Um, you know, WISH and U.S. Soy, we can really help deliver prosperity and strength across the globe um, through our products. And I, I'll give you some numbers to just kind of put to gravity the some of the situations out there. And nearly 10% of the world's population still goes to bed hungry every night. That's 385 million people in Asia, 300 million people in Africa, and 40 million people across Latin America and the Caribbean. And that's not even uh, talking about other parts of the globe. So that's nearly three quarters of a billion people uh, don't know where their next meal comes from. When you don't know where your next meal comes from, that that leaves you very vulnerable to exploitation, um, whether that's uh, from other countries, other actors who are maybe there for um, ulterior motives. U.S. Soy through Wish um, can head that off. Uh, we can provide uh, a safer, stronger geopolitical environment. Uh, we can do that right off the bat uh, by whether that's working with companies such as Adesia with their uh, soy nutrition bars for those who are acutely uh, in danger of, of uh, starvation. Uh, and then hopefully as economies grow, as those uh, uh, socioeconomic situations in those countries improve, that then transitions to consuming uh, while well, still some uh, soy protein in the human diet, but also consuming animal protein, which, uh, you know, poultry, aquaculture, we've talked a lot about. Soy can be your main protein-rich, uh, vitamin-rich ingredient uh, for the feed that you feed those, those animals, those fish, whatever you have it. Uh, one thing that we talked about last year uh, at the Global uh, food security dialogue we had in Annapolis. Uh, it's been nearly a year since that, and I can expect the discussion will continue in two months when we have have the next one. But promoting U.S. trade, U.S. agricultural trade, and part of the reason that's important, and and this is not just wish. This maybe I'm getting a little little off topic here, but uh, some of the most nefarious products are typically shipped in. Uh, um, bulk agricultural shipments. Uh, so if we're able to promote stronger trade and that starts at the wish level, that starts at the wish level and uh, um, kind of gets our footstep into the countries. So I guess that's what I wanna to touch on is it starts at wish, we get our foot into the door and that can help us uh, lead to more stable markets, more stable trade and it really, I believe, uh, improves geopol geopolitical um, tensions across the globe. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about this one as well. I touched on it maybe a little bit, but not quite uh, previously. And uh, when we talk about lower socioeconomic societies, a lot of times the majority of their calories, sometimes upwards of 80% of their calories uh, are coming from cereal-based foods. And, uh, you know, of course, when that happens, uh, that's what they need. That's how they get their, their calories because affordability is, is a concern. However, soy can be added uh, right away, um, very easily, very afford affordably into those uh those cereal-based foods that they're already eating. 
it will increase the protein profile, increase the vitamin nutrient profile of those foods and really helps fortify um, their, their daily intake of nutrients. And, and, you know, when we're looking across a lot of wish countries, I mean, that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at protein deficiencies. We're looking at the need to get more protein out there globally. And that is something that soy is perfectly positioned to do. Uh, Wish works with food manufacturers across Latin America, Africa, and Asia uh, to fortify foods uh, that are typically consumed. We're talking tortillas, various beverages, breads. Um, so we're able to incorporate that into um, traditional foods, whatever that may mean for that country. Uh, we're not changing what they're eating um, as far as what the food is. We're just improving it, I guess. And WISH is also working in those countries uh, to make soy a part of the, the food profile in uh, schools, uh, kind of getting it because a lot of times the children, they need the protein, they need the nutrients. And uh, that's where we can really start to create uh, not just the difference, but that's where we start to create the preference and the taste for soy and food such as that. All right. Thank you, Tony. And thanks to all of you for covering those seven trends and uh, introducing WISH to a lot of folks. I, I was fortunate to be able to travel with some early missions uh, that were hosted by WISH just to see the boots on the ground perspective. And so I want to follow up here with a few questions that I'm going to start with. But as I mentioned, uh, for all of our audience, we'd like you to participate. Please enter your questions in the Q&A portion of the chat of the area, not the chat, the Q&A portion. And uh, we'll look at those and, and bring those questions up as well. I know one already came in. It was asking if this webinar will be available later. And the answer is that is yes. Uh, we'll have it on agra, A-G-R-I hyphen pulse, P-U-L-S-E dot com tomorrow. And uh, we'll also share it with everybody who's already signed up for the webinar. So you'll have a copy to keep on your uh, laptop or desktop. Um, so just starting out with questions, uh, Maury, I was going to start with you here a little bit and, and have you give us kind of that breakdown of uh, some examples of how WISH has helped open up more, do and more doors for soybean trade opportunities. I know Tony mentioned, you know, it starts at the WISH level. And so maybe if you could uh, recall some of the things where you've started out and just some examples in, in countries where you have opened up these doors and it's it's led to higher consumption of U.S. soy. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, like we've talked about that as WISH works in these countries and we teach the natives the value of soy in their diets, naturally, you know, as a, as a soybean producer, ultimately we would like to see more trade with that company country. Um, it just goes hand in hand as we help these markets develop, they remember who helped them develop and they become a better trading partner and a better friend because of the travels that I've been on, people like to know who they do business with. And it's just, um, a, a nice feeling to know that whatever you're doing out there, even if the economies at the time might not allow for them to uh, purchase U.S. soy because of price differentials, and we know we have competitive partners around the world, that they still remember that that Wish was there and helped them get better equipped, better educated on how to use the feed, and as economies improve, our trade will improve. And so. You know, when I first started with the American Soybean Association and with WISH, I had no idea that we'd be in, uh, you know, 29 countries. You know, this big project in Cambodia has led to a, a great relationship and, and improved uh, trade opportunities. And I look for Africa and we're starting to work in some of the Asian countries, too. And so I just I just know, you know that I've always said that the American farmer is great at producing their product. We just need the markets to get rid of that over surplus that we have at times, like right now, 
and WISH does a great job in building that and developing that market. Thanks, Maury. Uh, Tony, a question for you. Uh, you talked about really one of the, probably the noblest things that farmers are able to do, and that is to feed those who are, are hungry and, and in need or food secure, insecure. Uh, as you look at the investments that are being made from U.S. soybean farmers into programs like WISH, what are some of the things you look like you look at in terms of how you measure your ROI and, and what you see is the returns and, and how you're assessing those? Yeah, of course. I think when you're talking WISH specifically, uh, it's multifaceted. I think the first step is after you've been in the country, uh, a lot of times your first step is education and learning what uh where we can help, where we can uh, provide assistance. A lot of times it might start as technical assistant, uh, teaching why, you know, using uh, soy pellets for aquaculture is better than, you know, the homemade brew that they throw out in the lakes now. So the first, first step that you start to see your ROI on is when you kind of see that light bulb go off and they start implementing what you're teaching them. That's your first step to see success. Then as that goes on, uh, you build up that network, you build up that platform, and then you see the, the drivers in the country, you see the feed manufacturers start to uh, prefer soy and the feed ingredients and, and kind of go through that natural progression of things. And ultimately, um, the success would be as hard as, as hard as it is to maybe leave a country or no longer need to invest there, but the success would be that the country has now moved towards commercialization of soy um, in their feed rations and their, their human consumption. Each country is going to be different in what that means, but that wish can kind of hand that country off to the next chain and the soy family to drive demand in that country. Wish creates it and then up the chain it goes to drive it. Thanks for that. Um, and Gina, you we already talked a little bit about a few of the bottlenecks that have emerged as you're trying to do your, your spade work on the ground. Uh, what do you see just kind of looking ahead for WISH as some of the biggest challenges that the organization faces? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and Maury kind of alluded to the, the price sensitivities of these developing and emerging markets. And that really shapes a lot of the work we do across the value chain. We know that U.S. soy is typically more expensive than other origins. And, and we may see a shift as the market dynamics are shifting in the U.S. that um, are you know, more favorable for our partners. But because of that, we're working through multifacets of the value chain. Um, one area that we've been working a lot in is, is financing. Um, and this is not unique to WISH. This is a conversation that is happening all across the international development and trade space. Um, there is a, a large gap in access to finance, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, really that 500,000 to 1.5 million is what we call a gray area. Um, and so anything under 500,000, there's typically microfinancing, you know, smaller loans that are easily accessible. Above 1.5 million, you have your large international finance, financial institutions that are willing to um, <clears throat> deploy that amount of financing. But that, that missing middle is where a lot of our partners um, are in for expanding their production lines or adding um, new equipment or new technology. And so we have been working in in collaboration with many other partners that are working in international space across a variety of sectors of how do we best start approaching this? How can we better connect our partners to resources? And one way that we did this most recently um, was we hosted about 10 of our supply chain partners from Ghana, Nigeria, Togo, and Uganda to the African Food Systems Forum, which took place in Rwanda. And it brought together leaders from all across the continent, including potential investors. Um, we actually had two of our partners that were accepted into the deal room, which was sort of like Shark Tank, um, where they got to pitch their companies to potential investors. Uh, it was a very competitive process. I mean, we helped them with their application, with their presentations, 
Um, and they did an amazing job of uh, laying out the case of, of what their company is trying to do. One was an aquaculture producer. The other was um, a human food producer that's moving into poultry and aquaculture feed, uh, both based in Ghana. Um, and immediately after their presentations, they had investors coming up to them wanting to continue the conversation. One partner currently has eight different conversations happening with different investors. Um, so really trying to find some innovative ways to connect those resources of, of finance um, with our partners. Another challenge we're facing is working with exporters who are willing to work with these developing emerging markets. There are real and perceived risk with uh, doing trade with a lot of these markets. Um, and so we've made a concerted effort over the past couple of years of educating not only US exporters of how to work with our partners in these markets, but also our partners on here's the lingo you need to use. Here is, um, you need to have your line of credit ready. You know, your price quote expires, just basic, um, you know, step by step how to work with US exporters so that when they connect, they can have a conversation that hopefully leads to actual trade and exports. Um, so that's been um, a, something that has been a large challenge, but we're starting to make headway in, in making those connections and really educating on both sides so that we can continue because we have partners who are wanting to buy US soy, but they're sometimes they get a roadblock when they try to reach out to exporters. We're all container markets. So, you know, it's it's smaller amounts of, of meal, for example, that are going in. Um, so finding those companies who are nimble and willing to take on a little bit extra risk to um, work in these new markets. A funny um, anecdote that we learned recently about one of our partners in Cambodia, she's bought several containers of, of US soy, um, IP grade beans. And, but she likes to do her orders through Facebook because that's very common in Cambodia. <laughs> So, you know, working on those cultural differences of how do we, she, she's a verified buyer, she has a good business plan, but she likes to put orders through Facebook. So how do we kind of shift so that she's able to effectively communicate with the U.S. exporter and still get um, the containers that she needs? Hmm. Yeah, that is, that is an interesting approach that you wouldn't normally think about. <laughs> um, well, I see some questions are coming in. I've got a, a couple more here and, and, and we can turn over to some audience questions. But um, I think more you could help lay the groundwork with this one and, and Gina maybe pitch in because some folks are, are asking about just, uh, you know, what is what is, differentiates WISH from other developmental programs and actually other trade promotion programs. I mean, within the soy family, we know that there's the Soybean Association that does that, the advocacy and policy front, and we've got USEC, and so we've got other groups, but even just looking at ag development programs, what do you think is the a differentiating factor for WISH? Well, uh, I appreciate getting this question beforehand, Sarah, and I've been thinking about it, and the best, I think, analogy that I can come up with is that if you think back to the old saying about you give a person a fish they eat for a day and you teach them how to fish they eat for, for a lifetime. Well, I think wish works as that person that teaches them how to fish, that they have that the expertise and the, and the willingness and the commitment to help educate, like I said earlier, educate and demonstrate how, how soy can help, you know, people eat better, live better and hopefully be a better customer for U.S. soy. So I just I just think that that wish by their demonstration shows that they're there for the long haul, and I think that's what differentiates differentiates wish from other ag programs and developments. And Gina or Tony, any want to add anything? Tony, not to put you on the spot, but you gave, gave a great football analogy um, back in July. Uh, and I don't know if you remember it. I think it was Travis Kelsey was involved um, and maybe some <laughs> others. <laughs> yeah, so I will I did not come up, come up with Travis Kelsey. Someone else did after I said this. So we'll leave that out there. But I, I use the analogy um, when looking at a football team, wish is your offensive line. They, they don't get the glory. They, they're kind of at the front lines. Uh, they get muddy, they get dirty. Um, but really the bottom line is that 
they create the holes to open up. They create the markets. Um, and then typically USEC, um, on my football team, we call them glory boys, but we won't get into that. But the running backs or the quarterbacks, they find those. So, so we, we help to create those, those markets, those gaps um, where we see U.S. soy can be a fit. And we open that up. And then our, our partner organization, USEC, once we open it up, they take the ball and they run and hopefully they score a touchdown. Um, which by that means, you know, commercialization of, of soy imports, uh, you becoming a, a main driver of U.S. soy. Thanks for that. Um, Gina, one of the, uh, a couple of questions have come in on this. And so I just wanted to have you kind of explain, um, obviously your developmental organization but what about competition from other countries, especially our friends in Brazil? Uh, you can you you can bring them to the opportunities with soy, but um, how do you then still compete? Given that there's other places they can buy soy protein, it's a great question. Um, and we see you know Argentinian and Brazilian soy all around the world. Um, and that's nothing, you know, it's not uncommon for us to see that on, on some of the, um, the times that we spend on the ground there. Um, and so it is something that we're constantly facing, especially that price differential. And so it's a, it's a very long-term approach of, like Maury said, educating, um, also becoming a, a good partner, like Tony mentioned. You don't see Brazil and Argentina having that technical assistance, that um, really soft diplomacy is what we call it, of working with our partners, giving them the tools and resources, them trusting us, knowing that, you know, we have connected them to trainings, to resources, we have their best interests in mind. Um, and I think that relationship, while it takes a while to build, it's really important as they start commercializing their operations, as their value chains become more efficient and resilient, that they start looking towards U.S. soy. Uh, many of our partners that have, have worked with us over the years through a variety of different programs, they know U.S. soy is a better quality. They've experienced it. They've come to the U.S. They've been on U.S. soybean farms. They've met farmers either in the U.S. or in country, and they know the quality is better. Um, we work with our partners at USAC to um, make that, that quality differentiation. They do a lot of research on that. Um, so we use that at the appropriate time with our partners as they're looking to try U.S. soy and we also utilize USDA programs such as the Quality Samples Program to get, you know, either soy flour or textured soy protein or soy meal into their hands so that they can actually use it and see the difference. Um, it is a continued challenge, um, especially with some of the markets um, in, you know, the southern part of, of Africa. It's an easier trade route to come from Brazil or Argentina. Most of the, the ships that are coming from the U.S., they have to go through Europe and then down the coast. Um, East Africa is especially um, difficult to get to. Um, you know, Southeast Asia, there's a lot of trade routes um, there that, you know, could be beneficial, advantageous for, for other origins as well. Um, but it's something that we continue to build those relationships, take every opportunity we can to show the value of U.S. soy. And we do see that our partners are starting to recognize and want U.S. soy, but we're having to also work on, you know, like I mentioned, the finance, the exporter, education, all these other into, uh, all these other aspects of the value chain. But we're starting to see progress. And I think, you know, one thing that we always have to remind our partners and stakeholders is this is a long-term approach. It really takes a long time to, to do all these things and get our partners where they need to be. Thanks. And um, I just want to explore that a little bit more. I'll start with you, Tony, and, and Maury, feel free to, to chime in too. But how important do you think the value is of having a farmer like yourself, Tony, where you can, you know, you're third generation, you've uh, been successful on a farm, and then you can talk to a small stakeholder who's maybe never experienced some of the opportunities that you've had. How How do you value that? relationship building and the things that Gina just described to, in order to not only make new customers, but retain new customers. Yeah. And I think, 
you know, part of it becomes an intrinsic value. Uh, it's hard to quantify, but I think bottom line, uh, some of the conversations I've had, uh, whether that be trade teams coming out to our farm or when I'm in country somewhere else, is you're able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. And then that person, that importer, uh, not it's not just the relationship, but they get to know you a little bit. They know that when I'm growing my soybeans, um, I'm growing them on my family farm. And my family lives on my family farm. And so I'm producing the soybeans, not a, just a high quality, but safely because my family lives here. You know, I'm not going to put my family in jeopardy for anything I do. And so not only how we're producing them sustainably, um, but also that we are focused on quality because uh, when you start importing soybeans, some of these countries, uh, due to the, the smaller scale at first, there's a higher likelihood, in my opinion, that more people along that chain will visually see the soybeans. They'll visually, you know, hold the soybeans. Uh, and there is a difference between American soybeans, U.S. soybeans, and South American soybeans. And if you right away show what high quality U.S. soy is, it makes it harder to stray from that. All right. Maury, anything you want to add? I'm sure that uh, you could talk about sheep and chickens and yeah. uh, share lots of good stories. But uh, just just to re reiterate what Tony said is, you know, the the people that I've had on my farm from other countries or where I've been, you know, across across the world and their countries culturally the markets that wish works in people want to see who they do business with and wish helps put a a face on u.s soy for those customers and like like tony said with the intrinsic value it's hard to quantify but i you know it's all about relationships and i i you know i just firmly believe that in the long run it pays off to have have that uh, connectivity and that relationship. So one of our questions came in from uh, Mike Ryan asking, um, uh, appreciating the discussion, asking about soy milk beverage industry. How does that fit into Wish's work on growing international value chains? And I can remember the soy cow. So um, Gina, I'm going to pass that off to you and have us uh, tell, tell us what how that really fits into Wish's work. Great. And um, it's, it, I was actually thinking the soy cow too. I saw that pop up and um, that was a really uh, a corner, cornerstone of, of a lot of Wish's earlier work was really focused on that human health aspect. Um, and so we worked with, you know, the Rotarians in Guatemala um, and, and elsewhere in Central America to have soy cows. Um, so, you know, small machines that can create uh, that soy milk uh, especially in more rural areas. And we were actually in Guatemala um, in August and, and got to catch up on, on how many soy cows are there, how um, different entities have started incorporating those and, and building those into their local communities to sell the soy milk, but also to have the Okara, the, the byproduct that's really high in protein as well, and incorporating that into local foods and baking. Um, and so we see that, you know, soy milk is still part of the conversation um, especially in, in Southeast Asia, it's a lot more culturally consumed there. We're working with um, a partner in Cambodia, actually the one who likes to place her orders on Facebook. Um, she makes soy milk and she's actually looking at incorporating U.S. IP beans into a kind of a premium line of soy milk for tourists, for hospitality industry, because um, she sees that it's a higher quality product and, and it really makes a, a very good high quality um soy milk. Um, and so we see that in, in different areas. Um, I, we actually met with um, a, an entrepreneur in, uh, while we were in Rwanda earlier this year who was from Burundi. Um, Burundi is one of the, the poorest countries in the world. It's a very small country, um, low GDP per capita. Um, but she made the drive up to, to Kigali to meet with us because she was interested in starting to make soy milk. She saw that there was an interest um, from consumers and her community, she sees it as a, a very affordable, accessible protein source. Um, so we started working with her on making connections. I um, mean, just from a personal note, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time in West Africa, especially in Ghana, over the past decade. 
Um, and when I was there most recently, I was getting coffee at the airport and they had soy milk as an option um, for your coffee. And that wasn't the case even five years ago. And um, we're starting to see a lot more interest, a lot more focus on healthy products. You know, soy milk is, is shelf stable. Um, in West Africa, dairy is not um, as uh, heavily consumed as other parts of the world. East Africa, they drink a lot of milk, eat a lot of teas. West Africa, that's not the case. So I think there's a really great opportunity for soy milk um, to kind of step in and, and play a role in providing another protein source. So it's still, we don't talk about it too much at Wish, but it's still definitely a part of our portfolio and um, the portfolio portfolios of many of our partners. Thank you. Um, we've got some other questions coming in. I know a couple of them have been in reference to what we can expect with tariffs, which is a policy area for all our American Soybean Association friends that uh, I'm sure they'll be watching carefully uh, because, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of discussion from President-elect Trump that he will be implementing across the board tariffs, but we we really don't have any any answers on that at this point in time other than to follow his publicly traded statements. So um, if people want to follow on the policy side, they can go to ASA and and, and check with them on those, those questions. Um, there are a couple more about just the ROI and following um, the developmental work into the actual uh, delivery of, of soybeans in the countries where you've worked. And I, I think on your website, you've got some additional information, Gina, and, and you've got just a, a kind of a track record, not only that, those maps that we showed earlier, uh, but indicating where you've been able to, to have some progress, correct? Correct. And, you know, I'd like to just reemphasize it's a long-term approach. So some markets, they um, grow faster and become more efficient more quickly. Um, Pakistan is a great example. We worked in Pakistan um, over a, a decade ago in the aquaculture space. Um, and it was a USDA, USAID project. And within five years, the, the feed industry really took off in Pakistan. Um, and so they became, you know, really a, a, a large importer of U.S. meal. And so we saw that that market really kind of transition into a commercial status. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've seen that in Pakistan. And, you know, we have several countries or, or market sectors within countries that um, really before COVID and before the war in Ukraine, I thought we're really um, starting to commercialize. Uh, but I feel like in developing emerging markets, it's always two steps forward, one step back. Um, geopolitical issues um, really hit hard. Um, you know, we there's been times where we've had coups in some of our markets and, you know, we're having to, to monitor those situations. And, and things change so rapidly. Um, that that can really, you know, take a drastic turn on many of our partners. Um, I will say that we had all of our partners that we had pre-COVID are still in business post-COVID, which is a huge testament to their resiliency to be able to pivot um, their production lines, their products, how they deliver to their customers. Um, and so I think that that shows a lot of positive growth um, and moving those partners in the direction of becoming customers if they're able to withstand those shots that really put the whole world at a halt. Yeah, you talk about the disruptions that we've seen around the globe. And obviously, Tony mentioned um, the population uh, centers that you want to go where you can have the most impact, I'm sure. But you also have to go where there's rule of law and a safe environment for people to actually go visit. Um, I'm sure on some of your your trade missions, it's uh, it, it's it's been iffy at times. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you want to share any examples of, of uh, what you've gone through in terms of trying to develop these markets. Well, and you're absolutely right. And we, you know, we take the safety of our staff, our consultants, and our partners very seriously when it comes to how we engage in markets. Um, you know, for example, we used to work in Burkina Faso. Um, and that has that direct um, investment involvement with our partners has kind of taken a halt um, as the widespread, um, you know, challenges across the Sahel have started moving south. And then Burkina is um, is is also becoming a part of that. I flew through Ouagadougou uh, several years ago and I said never again. It was a stopover, but I said I'm never <laughs> making a stop here again. Um, you know, we've had, we've seen it in Myanmar. Um, I think, you know, things are still a challenge there. We're still working with our partners, but having to be 
um, very careful in how we communicate and how we support them um, because they're still really interested in working um, and, and learning more about U.S. soy and learning how to incorporate soy. Um, but it's just taking into account that there are challenges within their country, within, you know, the, the ruling government um, or entity that is that's ruling the country that we really need to be um, aware of. Um, but, you know, we also look at opportunities for growth. And so sometimes, unfortunately, conflicts and challenges can put that to a halt. Uh, we had that happen in Ethiopia. We were really looking at the poultry space in Ethiopia several years ago, and then the civil war started in the northern part of the country. Um, and so we had to back out of our investment at that time because of the civil war. Now we're starting to re-engage in Ethiopia because there is a lot of opportunity, but we wanted to make sure that we were able to responsibly work uh, in the country. So just as we're um, we're getting near the closure of this webinar, uh, one thing that I'd like to have both Tony and, and Maury respond to is just, well, what are your hopes for five years from now and in, in terms of uh, where WISH might be going and, and what you're able to accomplish uh, over the uh, foreseeable future? And um, Tony, I'll throw that to you first. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was hoping I was going to have a minute or two to think about it, but... Uh... <laughs> No, in a five-year span, I think uh, Gina outlined uh, these are long-term approaches, uh, but in a five-year span, uh, I think just increased preference for uh, soy and uh, animal uh, rations or uh, soy in aquaculture industries across the countries that we work in. Uh, I believe there will be uh, one or two, probably one country, uh, in the next five years, probably in the next year or two, that will kind of transition away from uh, a wish country to hopefully a, a USAC country. So just that continued progress. It's slow, um, but I won't beat around the bush on that. But you're going into countries that, you know, if they grow soy, they harvest it by hand. Uh, if they even know what soy is, that's just a plus. So you have to educate on the benefits of it. They have to see it firsthand and then they have to adopt it. So. Maury, any other closing thoughts? Well, I, yeah, don't, don't disagree with what Tony said, but uh, I keep thinking back to what we started with as far as the, the growing populations around the world and growing economies. And so sooner or later, our so-called friends to the south of us won't be able to produce or keep producing and keep expanding as much as they have been in the last five years. And with the population growth, I I don't see any other opportunity other than having countries buy U.S. soy because we're going to be the customer of choice. And like we've talked about, we, we, we have the quality and we have the expertise to deliver. So I, I just think that uh, as wish continues, the the work will continue and keep growing. Thank you for all of your comments. And Gina, just as we wrap here, uh, there are a couple of people that wanted to reach out to our panelists. Can you tell us how, what the wish website is and how they can contact you? Absolutely. So our website is wish.org, W I S S S H H. Wish with two H's. <laughs> I never had to spell it out, so it kind of threw me off. Uh, .org. You can also follow us on LinkedIn. Um, and I would say that our, our LinkedIn is more up to date on programmatic updates, seeing what our partners are doing. Um, and that's a really great way to, to keep track of, of you know, what the latest and greatest is at Wish. Um, I'm happy to um, provide my email. I don't know if there's a, a way to do it in the chat um, and people can reach out to me and then I can um, connect them with the appropriate person. Um, and happy to answer any follow-up questions because I think there were some that we didn't get to because um, there were so many great ones, but but happy to provide my email um, and be sure to follow us on LinkedIn. Super. Well, thanks again for all of you and your terrific comments today and for our participants who provided some really good questions and we, we will let you follow up with those, especially those who provided their names. Um, I appreciate all of you for following AgriPulse and our webinars. If you want to continue to follow what we're writing on, whether it's ag development or trade or 
tariffs and a new farm bill, uh, please copy this uh, QR code or you can just go to the subscription uh, site on our page and get a one month free trial with no obligation. And uh, you can see what we're doing every day to serve farmers and ranchers and agribusinesses across the country. Um, and I'd also like to thank our sponsors today because without them, we can't have all these great conversations. So thanks to the American Soybean Association, United Soybean Board and WISH for sponsoring the event. And then uh, I, the question did come in on this and we'd just like to reiterate that the webinar will be available. A copy of it will be on our website tomorrow. And if you had already signed up as a participant, you'll get a link to that sent to you when it becomes available. And so you can share it or rewatch it then. Uh, and others that are interested, feel free to share it and make sure that you have a, a very good opportunity to keep all these incredible facts that we covered today in front of you. So thanks for everyone's participation again. And we really look forward to serving you again with another webinar in the future. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. So thanks again.